Chapter 107 The Hound of the Baskervilles is my favourite book. In The Hound of the Baskervilles, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson get a visit from James Mortimer, who is a doctor from the Moors in Devon. James Mortimer's friend, Sir Charles Baskerville, has died of a heart attack, and James Mortimer thinks that he might have been scared to death. James Mortimer also has an ancient scroll which describes the curse of the Baskervilles. On this scroll, it says that Sir Charles Baskerville had an ancestor called Sir Hugo Baskerville, who was a wild, profane and godless man, and he tried to do sex with the daughter of a yeoman, but she escaped, and he chased her across the moor and his friends, who were daredevil roisterers, chased after him. And when they found him, the daughter of the yeoman had died of exhaustion and fatigue, and they saw a great black beast shaped like a hound, yet larger than any hound that ever mortal eye has rested on, and this hound was tearing the throat out of Sir Hugo Baskerville. And one of the friends died of fear that very night, and the other two were broken men for the rest of their days. James Mortimer thinks that the Hound of the Baskervilles might have scared Sir Charles to death, and he's worried that his son and heir, Sir Henry Baskerville, will be in danger when he goes to the hall in Devon. So Sherlock Holmes sends Dr. Watson to Devon with Sir Henry Baskerville and James Mortimer, and Dr. Watson tries to work out who might have killed Sir Charles Baskerville, and Sherlock Holmes says that he will stay in London, but he travels to Devon secretly and does investigations of his own. And Sherlock Holmes finds out that Sir Charles was killed by a neighbour called Stapleton, who's a butterfly collector and a distant relation of the Baskervilles. And Stapleton is poor, so he tries to kill Sir Henry Baskerville so that he'll inherit the hall. In order to do this, he's brought a huge dog from London and covered it in phosphorus to make it glow in the dark. And it was this dog which scared Sir Charles Baskerville to death and Sherlock Holmes and Watson and Lestrade from Scotland Yard catch him. And Sherlock Holmes and Watson shoot the dog, which is one of the dogs which gets killed in the story, which isn't nice because it's not the dog's fault. And Stapleton escapes into the Grimpin Mire, which is part of the moor, and he dies because he's sucked into a bog. There are some bits of the story I don't like. One bit is the ancient scroll, because it's written in old language which is difficult to understand, like this. Learn then from this story not to fear the fruits of the past, but rather to be circumspect in the future, that those foul passions whereby our family has suffered so grievously may not again be loosed to our undoing. And sometimes Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who's the author, describes people like this. There was something subtly wrong with the face, some coarseness of expression, some hardness, perhaps, of eye, some looseness of lip which marred its perfect beauty. And I don't know what some hardness, perhaps, of eye means, and I'm not interested in faces. But sometimes it is fun not knowing what the words mean, because you can look them up in a dictionary, like goyle, which is a deep dip, or tors, which are hills or rocky heights. I like The Hound of the Baskervilles because it's a detective story, which means that there are clues and red herrings. These are some of the clues. 1. Two of Sir Henry Baskerville's boots go missing when he's staying at a hotel in London. This means that someone wants to give them to the Hound of the Baskervilles to smell like a bloodhound so that it can chase him. This means that the Hound of the Baskervilles is not a supernatural being, but a real dog. 2. Stapleton is the only person who knows how to get through the Grimpin Mire, and he tells Watson to stay out of it for his own safety. This means that he's hiding something in the middle of the Grimpin Mire and doesn't want anyone else to find it. 3. Mrs. Stapleton tells Dr. Watson to go straight back to London instantly. This is because she thinks Dr. Watson is Sir Henry Baskerville, and she knows that her husband wants to kill him. And these are some of the red herrings. 1. Sherlock Holmes and Watson are followed when they're in London by a man in a coach with a black beard. This makes you think that the man is Barrymore, who's the caretaker at Baskerville Hall, because he's the only other person who has a black beard. But the man is really Stapleton, who's wearing a false beard. 2. Selden, 
the Notting Hill murderer. This is a man who has escaped from a prison nearby and is being hunted down on the moors, which makes you think that he has something to do with the story, because he is a criminal, but he isn't anything to do with the story at all. 3. The Man on the Tor This is a silhouette of a man that Dr. Watson sees on the moor at night and doesn't recognise, which makes you think it's the murderer, but it's Sherlock Holmes who has come to Devon secretly. I also like The Hound of the Baskervilles because I like Sherlock Holmes, and I think that if I were a proper detective, he's the kind of detective I would be. He's very intelligent, and he solves the mystery, and he says... The world is full of obvious things which nobody by any chance ever observes. But he notices them, like I do. Also, it says in the book, Sherlock Holmes had, in a very remarkable degree, the power of detaching his mind at will. And this is like me, too. Because if I get really interested in something, like practicing maths, or reading a book about the Apollo missions, or great white sharks, I don't notice anything else. And Father can be calling me to come and eat my supper, and I won't hear him. And this is why I'm very good at playing chess, because I detach my mind at will and concentrate on the board. And after a while, the person I'm playing will stop concentrating and start scratching their nose or staring out the window and then they'll make a mistake, and I'll win. Also, Dr. Watson says about Sherlock Holmes, His mind was busy in endeavouring to frame some scheme into which all these strange and apparently disconnected episodes could be fitted. And that's what I'm trying to do by writing this book. Also, Sherlock Holmes doesn't believe in the supernatural, which is God and fairy tales and hounds of hell and curses, which are stupid things. And I'm going to finish this chapter with two interesting facts about Sherlock Holmes. 1. In the original Sherlock Holmes stories, Sherlock Holmes is never described as wearing a deerstalker hat, which is what he's always wearing in pictures and cartoons. The deerstalker hat was invented by a man called Sidney Paget, who did the illustrations for the original books. 2. In the Sherlock Holmes stories, Sherlock Holmes never says... Elementary, my dear Watson. He only ever says this in films and on television. Chapter 109 That night I wrote some more of my book, and the next morning I took it into school so that Siobhan could read it and tell me if I'd made mistakes with the spelling and the grammar. Siobhan read the book during morning break, when she has a cup of coffee and sits at the edge of the playground with the other teachers. And after morning break, she came and sat down next to me, and said she had read the bit about my conversation with Mrs. Alexander, and she said, Have you told your father about this? And I replied, No. And she said, Are you going to tell your father about this? And I replied, No. And she said, Good. I think that's a good idea, Christopher. And then she said, Did it make you sad to find this out? And I asked, Find what out? And she said, Did it make you upset to find out that your mother and Mr. Shears had an affair? And I said, No. And she said, Are you telling the truth, Christopher? And then I said, I always tell the truth. And she said, I know you do, Christopher, but sometimes we get sad about things, and we don't like to tell other people that we are sad about them. We like to keep it a secret. Or sometimes we're sad, but we don't really know we're sad. So we say we aren't sad, but we really are. And I said, I'm not sad. And she said, if you do start to feel sad about this, I want you to know that you can come and talk to me about it because I think talking to me will help you feel less sad. And if you don't feel sad, but you just want to talk to me about it, that would be okay too. Do you understand? And I said, I understand. And she said, good. And I replied, but I don't feel sad about it, because Mother's dead, and because Mr. Shears isn't around anymore. So I would be feeling sad about something that isn't real and doesn't exist. And that would be stupid. 
and then I practised maths for the rest of the morning, and at lunch I didn't have the quiche because it was yellow, but I did have the carrots and the peas and lots of tomato ketchup. And for afters I had some blackberry and apple crumble, but not the crumble bit because that was yellow too, and I got Mrs Davis to take the crumble bit off before she put it onto my plate, because it doesn't matter if different sorts of food are touching before they're actually on your plate. Then, after lunch, I spent the afternoon doing art with Mrs. Peters, and I painted some pictures of aliens. Chapter 113 My memory is like a film. That's why I'm really good at remembering things, like the conversations I've written down in this book, and what people were wearing, and what they smelled like because my memory has a smell track, which is like a soundtrack. And when people ask me to remember something, I can simply press rewind and fast forward and pause, like on a video recorder, but more like a DVD, because I don't have to rewind through everything in between to get to a memory of something a long time ago. And there are no buttons either, because it's happening in my head. If someone says to me, Christopher, tell me what your mother was like, I can rewind to lots of different scenes and say what she was like in those scenes. For example, I could rewind to 4th July 1992 when I was nine years old, which was a Saturday, and we were on holiday in Cornwall, and in the afternoon we were on the beach in a place called Polparo, and Mother was wearing a pair of shorts made out of denim and a light blue bikini top, and she was smoking cigarettes called consulate, which were mint flavour. And she wasn't swimming. Mother was sunbathing on a towel which had red and purple stripes, and she was reading a book by Georgette Heyer called The Masqueraders. And then she finished sunbathing and went into the water to swim, and she said, Bloody Nora, it's cold! And she said, I should come and swim too, but I don't like swimming because I don't like taking my clothes off. And she said I should just roll up my trousers and walk into the water a little way, so I did. And I stood in the water. And Mother said, Look, it's lovely. And she jumped backwards and disappeared under the water. And I thought a shark had eaten her, and I screamed. And she stood up out of the water again and came over to where I was standing and held up her right hand and spread her fingers out in a fan and said, Come on, Christopher, touch my hand. Come on now, stop screaming. Touch my hand. Listen to me, Christopher, you can do it. And after a while I stopped screaming and held up my left hand and spread my fingers out in a fan, and we made our fingers and our thumbs touch each other. And Mother said, It's okay, Christopher, it's okay. There aren't any sharks in Cornwall. And then I felt better. Except I can't remember anything before I was about four, because I wasn't looking at things in the right way before then, so they didn't get recorded properly. And this is how I recognise someone if I don't know who they are. I see what they're wearing, or if they have a walking stick, or funny hair, or a certain type of glasses, or they have a particular way of moving their arms, and I do a search through my memories to see if I've met them before. And this is also how I know how to act in difficult situations when I don't know what to do. For example, if people say things which don't make sense, like... See you later, alligator, or you'll catch your death in that. I'll do a search and see if I've ever heard someone say this before. And if someone is lying on the floor at school, I do a search through my memory to find a picture of someone having an epileptic fit. And then I compare the picture with what's happening in front of me, so I can decide whether they're just lying down and playing a game, or having a sleep, or whether they're having an epileptic fit. And if they are having an epileptic fit, I move any furniture out of the way to stop them banging their head, and I take my jumper off and I put it underneath their head, and I go and find a teacher. Other people have pictures in their heads too, but they're different, because the pictures in my head are all pictures of things which really happened. But other people have pictures in their heads of things which aren't real and didn't happen. For example, sometimes Mother used to say, if I hadn't married your father, I think I'd be living in a little farmhouse in the south of France with someone called Jean. And he'd be, oh, a local handyman, you know, doing painting and decorating for people, gardening, building fences. 
and we'd have a veranda with figs growing over it. And there'd be a field of sunflowers at the bottom of the garden, and a little town on the hill in the distance. And we'd sit outside in the evening and drink red wine and smoke Galois cigarettes and watch the sun go down. And Siobhan once said that when she felt depressed or sad, she'd close her eyes and she'd imagine that she was staying in a house on Cape Cod with her friend Ellie, and they'd take a trip on a boat from Provincetown and go out into the bay to watch the humpback whales, and that made her feel calm and peaceful and happy. And sometimes, when someone has died, like Mother died, people say, what would you want to say to your mother if she was here now? Or... What would your mother think about that? Which is stupid, because mother's dead, and you can't say anything to people who are dead, and dead people can't think. And grandmother has pictures in her head too, but her pictures are all confused, like someone's muddled the film up and she can't tell what happened in what order, so she thinks that dead people are still alive, and she doesn't know whether something happened in real life or whether it happened on television. Chapter 127 When I got home from school, father was still out at work, so I unlocked the front door and went inside and took my coat off. I went into the kitchen and put my things on the table, and one of the things was this book which I had taken into school to show to Siobhan. I made myself a raspberry milkshake and heated it up in the microwave, and then went through to the living room to watch one of my Blue Planet videos about life in the deepest parts of the ocean. The video was about the sea creatures who live around sulphur chimneys, which are underwater volcanoes where gases are ejected from the Earth's crust into the water. Scientists never expected there to be any living organisms there because it was so hot and so poisonous, but there are whole ecosystems there. I like this bit because it shows you that there's always something new that science can discover, and all the facts that you take for granted can be completely wrong. And also, I like the fact that they're filming in a place which is harder to get to than the top of Mount Everest, but is only a few miles away from sea level. And it's one of the quietest and darkest and most secret places on the surface of the Earth. And I like imagining that I'm there sometimes, in a spherical metal submersible with windows that are 30 centimetres thick to stop them from imploding under the pressure. And I imagine that I am the only person inside it, and that it's not connected to a ship at all, but it can operate under its own power. And I can control the motors and move anywhere I want to on the seabed, and I can never be found. Father came home at 5.48 p.m. I heard him come through the front door. Then he came into the living room. He was wearing a lime green and sky blue check shirt, and there was a double knot on one of his shoes, but not on the other. He was carrying an old advert for Fussell's milk powder, which was made of metal and painted with blue and white enamel and covered with little circles of rust which were like bullet holes, but he didn't explain why he was carrying this. He said... Howdy, partner, which is a joke he does. And I said, hello. I carried on watching the video, and father went into the kitchen. I had forgotten that I had left my book lying on the kitchen table, because I was too interested in the Blue Planet video. This is what is called relaxing your guard, and it's what you must never do if you're a detective. It was 5.54 p.m. when father came back into the living room. He said, What is this? But he said it very quietly, and I didn't realise that he was angry because he wasn't shouting. He was holding the book in his right hand. I said, It's a book I'm writing. And he said, Is this true? Did you talk to Mrs. Alexander? He said this very quietly as well, so I still didn't realise that he was angry. And I said, Yes. Then he said, Holy fucking Jesus, Christopher, how stupid are you? This is what Siobhan says is called a rhetorical question. It has a question mark at the end, but you're not meant to answer it because the person who's asking it already knows the answer. It's difficult to spot a rhetorical question. Then father said, What the fuck did I tell you, Christopher? 
this was much louder. And I replied, Not to mention Mr. Shear's name in our house, and not to go asking Mrs. Shear's or anyone about who killed that bloody dog, and not to go trespassing in other people's gardens, and to stop this ridiculous bloody detective game, except I haven't done any of those things. I just asked Mrs. Alexander about Mr. Shears because. But father interrupted me and said, Don't give me that bollocks, you little shit. You knew exactly what you were bloody doing. I've read the book, remember? And when he said this, he held up the book and shook it. What else did I say, Christopher? I thought that this might be another rhetorical question, but I wasn't sure. I found it hard to work out what to say because I was starting to get scared and confused. Then father repeated the question. What else did I say, Christopher? I said, I don't know. And he said, Come on, you're the fucking memory man. But I couldn't think. And father said, Not to go around sticking your fucking nose into other people's business. And what do you do? You go around sticking your nose into other people's business. You go around raking up the past and sharing it with every Tom, Dick, and Harry you bump into. What am I going to do with you, Christopher? What the fuck am I going to do with you? I said, I was just doing chatting with Mrs. Alexander. I wasn't doing investigating. And he said, I ask you to do one thing for me, Christopher. One thing. And I said, I didn't want to talk to Mrs. Alexander. It was Mrs. Alexander who. But father interrupted me and grabbed hold of my arm really hard. Father had never grabbed hold of me like that before. Mother had hit me sometimes because she was a very hot tempered person, which means that she got angry more quickly than other people and she shouted more often. But father is a more level headed person, which means he doesn't get angry as quickly and he doesn't shout as often. So I was very surprised when he grabbed me. I don't like it when people grab me, and I don't like being surprised either. So I hit him, like I hit the policeman when he took hold of my arms and lifted me onto my feet. But father didn't let go, and he was shouting, and I hit him again, and then I didn't know what I was doing any more. I had no memories for a short while. I know it was a short while because I checked my watch afterwards. It was like someone had switched me off and then switched me on again. And when they switched me on again, I was sitting on the carpet with my back against the wall and there was blood on my right hand and the side of my head was hurting. And father was standing on the carpet a meter in front of me, looking down at me, and he was still holding my book in his right hand. But it was bent in half, and all the corners were messed up, and there was a scratch on his neck and a big rip in the sleeve of his green and blue check shirt, and he was breathing really deeply. After about a minute, he turned and he walked through to the kitchen. Then he unlocked the back door into the garden and went outside. I heard him lift the lid of the dustbin and drop something into it and put the lid of the dustbin back on. Then he came back into the kitchen again, but he wasn't carrying the book any more. Then he locked the back door and put the key into the little china jug that shaped like a fat nun, and he stood in the middle of the kitchen and closed his eyes. Then he opened his eyes and he said, I need a fucking drink. And he got himself a can of beer. Chapter 131.、No. These are some of the reasons why I hate yellow and brown. Yellow. One. Custard. Two. Bananas. Bananas also turn brown. Three. Double yellow lines. Four. Yellow fever. Which is a disease from tropical America and West Africa, which causes a high fever. Acute nephritis, jaundice, and hemorrhages. And it's caused by a virus transmitted by the bite of a mosquito called Aedes aegypti, which used to be called Stegomyia fasciata, and nephritis is inflammation of the kidneys. 5. Yellow flowers. 
because I get hay fever from flower pollen, which is one of three sorts of hay fever, and the others are from grass pollen and fungus pollen, and it makes me feel ill. 6. Sweet corn. Because it comes out in your poo and you don't digest it, so you're not really meant to eat it, like grass or leaves. Brown. 1. Dirt. 2. Gravy. 3. Poo. 4. Wood. Because people used to make machines and vehicles out of wood, but they don't anymore because wood breaks and goes rotten and has worms in sometimes, and now people make machines and vehicles out of metal and plastic, which are much better and more modern. 5. Melissa Brown who is a girl at school, who is not actually brown like Anil or Mohammed. It's just her name, but she tore my big astronaut painting into two pieces and I threw it away, even after Mrs. Peters sellotaped it together again, because it looked broken. Mrs. Forbes said that hating yellow and brown is just being silly, and Siobhan said that she shouldn't say things like that, and everyone has favourite colours, and Siobhan was right, but Mrs. Forbes was a bit right too, because it is sort of being silly. But in life, you have to take lots of decisions, and if you don't take decisions, you would never do anything, because you'd spend all your time choosing between things you could do. So it's good to have a reason why you hate some things and you like others. It's like being in a restaurant, like when Father takes me out to a Bernie Inn sometimes, and you look at the menu, and you have to choose what you're going to have. But you don't know if you're going to like something because you haven't tasted it yet. So you have favourite foods, and you choose these. And you have foods you don't like, and you don't choose these. And then it's simple. Chapter 137 The next day, Father said he was sorry that he had hit me, and he didn't mean to. He made me wash the cut on my cheek with Dettol to make sure that it wasn't infected. Then he got me to put a plaster on it so it didn't bleed. Then, because it was a Saturday, he said he was going to take me on an expedition to show me that he was properly sorry and we were going to Trois-Cross Zoo. So he made me some sandwiches with white bread and tomatoes and lettuce and ham and strawberry jam for me to eat because I don't like eating food from places I don't know. And he said it would be okay, because there wouldn't be too many people at the zoo, because it was forecast to rain. And I was glad about that, because I don't like crowds of people, and I like it when it's raining. So I went and got my waterproof, which is orange. Then we drove to Twycross Zoo. I had never been to Twycross Zoo before, so I didn't have a picture of it in my mind before we got there. So we bought a guidebook from the information centre, and then we walked round the whole zoo, and I decided which were my favourite animals. My favourite animals were 1. Randy Man, which is the name of the oldest red-faced black spider monkey, Ateles paniscus paniscus, ever kept in captivity. Randy Man is 44 years old, which is the same age as father. He used to be a pet on a ship and have a metal band round his stomach, like in a story about pirates. 2. The Patagonian sea lions, which are called Miracle and Star. 3. Maliku, which is an orangutan. I liked it especially because it was lying in a kind of hammock made out of a pair of stripy green pyjama bottoms, and on the blue plastic notice next to the cage, it said it made the hammock itself. Then we went to the cafe, and Father had place and chips and apple pie and ice cream and a pot of Earl Grey tea, and I had my sandwiches, and I read the guidebook to the zoo. And Father said, I love you very much, Christopher. Don't ever forget that. And I know I lose my rag occasionally. I know I get angry. I know I shout. And I know I shouldn't. But I only do it because I worry about you because I don't want to see you getting into trouble, because I don't want you to get hurt. Do you understand? I didn't know whether I understood, so I said, I don't know. 
and father said, Christopher, do you understand that I love you? And I said, yes, because loving someone is helping them when they get into trouble and looking after them and telling them the truth. And father looks after me when I get into trouble, like coming to the police station. And he looks after me by cooking meals for me. And he always tells me the truth, which means that he loves me. And then he held up his right hand and spread his fingers out in a fan. And I held up my left hand and spread my fingers out in a fan. And we made our fingers and thumbs touch each other. Then I got out a piece of paper from my bag and I did a map of the zoo from memory as a test. Then we went and looked at the giraffes. And the smell of their poo was like the smell inside the gerbil cage at school when we had gerbils. And when they ran, their legs were so long it looked like they were running in slow motion. Then father said we had to get home before the roads got busy. Chapter 139 I like Sherlock Holmes, but I do not like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was the author of the Sherlock Holmes stories. That is because he wasn't like Sherlock Holmes, and he believed in the supernatural. And when he got old, he joined the Spiritualist Society, which meant that he believed you could communicate with the dead. This was because his son died of influenza during the First World War, and he still wanted to talk to him. And in 1917, something famous happened called the Case of the Cottingley Fairies. Two cousins called Francis Griffiths, who was nine years old, and Elsie Wright, who was sixteen years old, said they used to play with fairies by a stream called Cottingley Beck, and they used Francis's father's camera to take five photographs of the fairies. But they weren't real fairies. They were drawings on pieces of paper that they cut out and stood up with pins because Elsie was a really good artist. Harold Snelling, who was an expert in fake photography, said, These dancing figures are not made of paper nor any fabric. They are not painted on a photographic background. But what gets me most is that all these figures have moved during the exposure. But he was being stupid because paper would move during an exposure and the exposure was very long because in the photograph you can see a little waterfall in the background and it's blurred. Then Sir Arthur Conan Doyle heard about the pictures and he said he believed they were real in an article in a magazine called The Strand. But he was being stupid too because if you look at the pictures you can see that the fairies look just like fairies in old books and they have wings and dresses and tights and shoes which is like aliens landing on earth and being like Daleks from Doctor Who or Imperial Stormtroopers from the Death Star in Star Wars or little green men like in cartoons of aliens. And in 1981, a man called Joe Cooper interviewed Elsie Wright and Francis Griffiths for an article in a magazine called The Unexplained. And Elsie Wright said all five photographs had been faked. And Francis Griffiths said that four had been faked, but one was real. And they said Elsie had drawn the fairies from a book called Princess Mary's Gift Book by Arthur Shepperson. And this shows that sometimes people want to be stupid, and they do not want to know the truth. And it shows that something called Occam's razor is true. And Occam's razor is not a razor that men shave with, but a law. And it says, Entia non sunt multiplicanda praeta necessitatum. Which is Latin, and it means, No more things should be presumed to exist than are absolutely necessary. Which means, that a murder victim is usually killed by someone known to them and fairies are made out of paper and you can't talk to someone who is dead. Chapter 149 When I went to school on Monday, Siobhan asked me why I had a bruise on the side of my face. I said that father was angry and he had grabbed me so I had hit him and then we had a fight. Siobhan asked whether father had hit me, and I said I didn't know because I got very cross and it made my memory go strange. And then she asked if father had hit me because he was angry, 
And I said, he didn't hit me, he grabbed me, but he was angry. And Siobhan asked if he grabbed me hard, and I said that he had grabbed me hard. And Siobhan asked if I was frightened about going home, and I said I wasn't. And then she asked me if I wanted to talk about it any more, and I said that I didn't. And then she said, okay. And we didn't talk about it any more, because grabbing is okay if it's on your arm or your shoulder when you're angry, but you can't grab someone's hair or their face. But hitting is not allowed, except if you're already in a fight with someone, then it's not so bad. When I got home from school, father was still at work. So I went into the kitchen, and I took the key out of the little china jug shaped like a nun and opened the back door and went outside and looked inside the dustbin to find my book. I wanted to get my book back because I liked writing it. I liked having a project to do, and I liked it especially if it was a difficult project, like a book. Also, I still didn't know who had killed Wellington, and my book was where I had kept all the clues that I had discovered, and I did not want them to be thrown away. But my book wasn't in the dustbin. I put the lid back on the dustbin and walked down the garden to have a look in the bin where Father keeps the garden waste, such as lawn clippings and apples that have fallen off the trees, but my book wasn't in there either. I wondered if Father had put it into his van and driven to the tip and put it into one of the big bins there, but I didn't want that to be true, because then I would never see it again. One other possibility was that Father had hidden my book somewhere in the house, so I decided to do some detecting and see if I could find it, except that I had to keep listening really hard all the time so I would hear his van when he pulled up outside the house so he wouldn't catch me being a detective. I started by looking in the kitchen. My book was approximately 25 centimetres by 35 centimetres by 1 centimetre, so it couldn't be hidden in a very small place, which meant that I didn't have to look in any really small places. I looked on top of the cupboards and down the back of the drawers and under the oven and I used my special mag light torch and a piece of mirror from the utility room to help me see into the dark spaces at the back of the cupboards where the mice used to get in from the garden and have their babies. Then I detected in the utility room. Then I detected in the dining room. Then I detected in the living room where I found the missing wheel from my Airfix Messerschmitt BF109 G6 model under the sofa. Then I thought I heard father coming through the front door, and I jumped, and I tried to stand up fast, and I banged my knee on the corner of the coffee table, and it hurt a lot, but it was only one of the drug people next door dropping something on the floor. Then I went upstairs, but I didn't do any detecting in my own room, because I reasoned that father wouldn't hide something from me in my own room unless he was being very clever and doing what's called a double bluff, like in a real murder mystery novel, so I decided to look in my own room only if I couldn't find the book anywhere else. I detected in the bathroom, but the only place to look was in the airing cupboard, and there was nothing in there, which meant that the only room left to detect in was Father's bedroom. I didn't know whether I should look in there, because he had told me not to mess with anything in his room, but if he was going to hide something from me, the best place to hide it would be in his room. So I told myself I would not mess with things in his room. I would move them, and then I would move them back. And he would never know I'd done it, so he wouldn't be angry. I started by looking under the bed. There were seven shoes, and a comb with lots of hair in it, and a piece of copper pipe, and a chocolate biscuit, and a porn magazine called Fiesta, and a dead bee, and a Homer Simpson pattern tie, and a wooden spoon, but not my book. Then I looked in the drawers on either side of the dressing table, but these only contained aspirin and nail clippers and batteries and dental floss, and a tampon and tissues, and a spare false tooth, in case father lost the false tooth he had to fill the gap where he knocked a tooth out when he fell off the ladder, putting a bird box up in the garden, but my book wasn't in there either. Then I looked in his clothes cupboard. This was full of clothes on hangers. There was also a little shelf at the top that I could see onto if I stood on the bed, but I had to take my shoes off in case I left a dirty footprint that would be a clue 
if father decided to do some detecting. But the only things on the shelf were more porn magazines and a broken sandwich toaster and twelve wire coat hangers and an old hair dryer that used to belong to mother. In the bottom of the cupboard was a large plastic toolbox, which was full of tools for doing do it yourself, like a drill and a paintbrush and some screws and a hammer. But I could see these without opening the box because it was made of transparent grey plastic. Then I saw that there was another box underneath the toolbox, so I lifted the toolbox out of the cupboard. The other box was an old cardboard box that's called a shirt box because people used to buy shirts in them. And when I opened the shirt box, I saw my book was inside. Then, I didn't know what to do. I was happy because father hadn't thrown my book away, but if I took the book, he would know I had been messing with things in his room, and he'd be very angry. And I had promised not to mess with things in his room. Then. I heard his van pulling up outside the house, and I knew that I had to think fast and be clever. So I decided that I would leave the book where it was, because I reasoned that Father wasn't going to throw it away if he had put it into the shirt box, and I could carry on writing in another book that I would keep really secret. And then, maybe later, he might change his mind and let me have the first book back again, and I could copy the new book into it. And if he never gave it back to me, I would be able to remember most of what I had written. So I would put it all into the second secret book. And if there were bits I wanted to check to make sure I had remembered them correctly, I could come into his room when he was out and check. Then I heard father shutting the door of the van. And that was when I saw the envelope. It was an envelope addressed to me, and it was lying under my book in the shirt box with some other envelopes. I picked it up. It had never been opened. It said, "Christopher Boone, thirty-six Randolph Street, Swindon, Wiltshire." Then I noticed that there were lots of other envelopes, and they were all addressed to me. And this was interesting, and confusing. And then I noticed how the words Christopher and Swindon were written. They were written with little circles instead of dots over the letter I. I only know three people who do little circles instead of dots over the letter I, and one of them is Shivon, and one of them was Mr. Loxley, who used to teach at the school, and one of them was Mother. And then I heard Father opening the front door, so I took one envelope from under the book and I put the lid back on the shirt box and I put the tool box back on top of it and I closed the cupboard door really carefully. And Father called out, "Christopher." I said nothing because he might be able to hear where I was calling from. I stood up and walked round the bed to the door, holding the envelope, trying to make as little noise as possible. Father was standing at the bottom of the stairs, and I thought he might see me, but he was flicking through the post which had come that morning, so his head was pointing downwards. Then he walked away from the foot of the stairs towards the kitchen, and I closed the door of his room very quietly and went into my own room. I wanted to look at the envelope, but I didn't want to make father angry, so I hid the envelope underneath my mattress. Then I walked downstairs and said hello to father. And he said, "So, what have you been up to today, young man?" And I said, "Today we did life skills with Mrs. Gray, which was using money and public transport, and I had tomato soup for lunch and three apples." And I practiced some maths in the afternoon, and we went for a walk in the park with Mrs. Peters and collected leaves for making collages. And Father said, "Excellent, excellent. What's your fancy for chow tonight?" Chow is food. I said I wanted baked beans and broccoli, and Father said, "I think that can be very easily arranged." Then I sat on the sofa and I read some more of the book I was reading called Chaos by James Glick. Then I went into the kitchen and had my baked beans and broccoli, while Father had sausages and eggs and fried bread and a mug of tea. Then Father said, "I'm going to put those shelves up in the living room, if that's all right with you. I'll make a bit of a racket, I'm afraid. So if you want to watch television, we're going to have to shift it upstairs." And I said, "I'll go and be on my own in my room." And he said, "Good man." And I said, "Thank you for supper." 
because that is being polite. And he said, No problem, kiddo. And I went up to my room. And when I was in my room, I shut the door, and I took out the envelope from underneath my mattress. I held the letter up to the light to see if I could detect what was inside the envelope, but the paper of the envelope was too thick. I wondered whether I should open the envelope, because it was something I had taken from father's room. But then I reasoned that it was addressed to me, so it belonged to me, so it was okay to open it. So I opened the envelope. Inside there was a letter. And this is what was written in the letter. 451 Chapter Road, Willesden, London, NW25NG, 0208. 887-8907 Dear Christopher, I'm sorry it's been such a very long time since I wrote my last letter to you. I've been very busy. I've got a new job working as a secretary for a factory that makes things out of steel. You'd like it a lot. The factory is full of huge machines that make the steel and cut it and bend it into whatever shapes they need. This week they're making a roof for a cafe in a shopping centre in Birmingham. It's shaped like a huge flower and they're going to stretch canvas over it to make it look like an enormous tent. Also, we've moved into the new flat at last, as you can see from the address. It's not as nice as the old one and I don't like Wilsden very much, but it's easier for Roger to get to work and he's bought it. He only rented the other one, so we can get our own furniture and paint the walls the colour we want to. And that's why it's been such a long time since I wrote my last letter to you, because it's been hard work packing up all our things and then unpacking them and then getting used to this new job. I'm very tired now, and I must go to sleep, and I want to put this into the letterbox tomorrow morning, so I'll sign off now and write you another letter soon. You haven't written to me yet, so I know that you're probably still angry with me. I'm sorry, Christopher. But I still love you. I hope you don't stay angry with me forever. And I'd love it if you were able to write me a letter, but remember to send it to the new address. I think about you all the time. Lots of love. Your mum. Then I was really confused, because Mother had never worked as a secretary for a firm that made things out of steel. Mother had worked as a secretary for a big garage in the centre of town. And Mother had never lived in London. Mother had always lived with us. And Mother had never written a letter to me before. There was no date on the letter, so I couldn't work out when Mother had written the letter, and I wondered whether someone else had written the letter and pretended to be Mother. And then I looked at the front of the envelope, and I saw that there was a postmark, and there was a date on the postmark, and it was quite difficult to read, but it said, London, 16... 1097, which meant that the letter was posted on 16th October 1997, which was 18 months after Mother had died. And then the door of my bedroom opened, and Father said, What are you doing? I said, I'm reading a letter. And he said, I'll finish the drilling. That David Attenborough nature program's on telly if you're interested. I said, OK. Then he went downstairs again. I looked at the letter and thought really hard. It was a mystery and I couldn't work it out. Perhaps the letter was in the wrong envelope and it had been written before Mother had died. But why was she writing from London? The longest she had been away was a week when she went to visit her cousin Ruth who had cancer, but Ruth lived in Manchester. And then I thought that Perhaps it wasn't a letter from Mother. Perhaps it was a letter to another person called Christopher from that Christopher's mother. I was excited. When I started writing my book, there was only one mystery I had to solve. Now there were two. I decided that I wouldn't think about it any more that night because I didn't have enough information and you could easily leap to the wrong conclusions, like Mr. Athelney Jones of Scotland Yard, which is a dangerous thing to do because you should make sure you have all the available clues before you start deducing things. That way you're much less likely to make a mistake. I decided that I would wait until Father was out of the house. Then 
or would go into the cupboard in his bedroom and look at the other letters and see who they were from and what they said. I folded the letter and hid it under my mattress in case father found it and got cross. Then I went downstairs and watched the television. Chapter 151